I'm Nihal Kularatna uh, from Waikato University. Uh, my passion for uh, electronic engineering started almost at the age of six. When I lived in a small uh, country, Sri Lanka, in the Indian Ocean, uh, during the month of May, there were some very uh, comprehensive uh, decorations done for the Buddhist festivals. Huge uh, uh, flashing lights, uh, thousands of flashing lights on these pandals uh, depicting Lord Buddha's life. So now uh, I was trying to see how these lights are flashed uh, in various nice sequences. Then when I peeped onto the back of these decorations, I saw a huge, uh, huge uh, piece of uh, timber turning with electrical connections made and broken in various sequences where this big roller was run by an electric motor. So then I started learning the switching involved in these kinds of uh, decorations. So that hooked me onto this thing and I started building tiny models of those uh, decorations with tiny uh, little things which I was turning manually. And that passion came all the way into my university life and when I was entering the university I was determined to be an electrical engineer. But at that time, most universities in the world in 1970s, they did not have any electronic engineering type programs. They had only electrical engineering. So I selected electrical engineering and picked more electronic engineering subjects. Then during my university time, as a hobbyist, I used to build transistor radios, amplifiers, etc. for the fun of doing it. And some of my friends said, uh, my products playing in their rooms, listening to FM channels and various other things. So that gave me a very practical footing on fundamentals of electrical engineering. For example, when I was doing my university entrance exams in the school, I was quite thorough with the transformer fundamentals, which I was learning that in the university only in the second year, not even in the first year. So my practical opportunities and the passion gave me a very good start to electronic engineering career. Then, at the end of my graduation, I was offered a university lecturer's position for in a university with the option of going for postgraduate opportunity abroad. But I didn't like teaching at that time. I said bye to that job in six months time, went and joined the airports as an electronics engineer working on ground equipment like communication systems, navigational aids and similar systems. So, for six years, I was a person who was going deeper into this American or French uh, installations in my country's only international airport and the associated area control center. So I learned huge amounts of practical electronic systems which were worth millions of dollars designed by large teams of engineers. But when I was analyzing them, they all had essential principles of electronic engineering and related subjects. So I, due to my passion, I learned everything uh, by playing with them, playing with instruments, fault tracing them. Sometimes I used to call it burning and learning. After my six years of aviation career, I changed my job going to Middle East to work on latest uh, digital telephone exchanges by LM Ericsson Sweden. After three years of that work, when I returned to my home country Sri Lanka, they were setting up a very large research institution named Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technologies in honor of the person who predicted satellite communication, that is Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who lived in Sri Lanka for over 37 years. 
So when I was hired by that institution as an R&D engineer, I went back to my aviation and uh, telecom engineer times with my trainings I received in United States, France or UK uh, with various short courses. I thought of developing my own short courses for the practical engineers in Sri Lanka. So one, first course I developed was electronic test and machining instruments for engineers. So after four or five years of developing that course, I felt this course has uh, uh, has enough material for a published book. So the output was my first book in 1996, published by Institution of Electrical Engineers London in 96. Yeah. From my very first book in 96, through my uh, short courses developed for engineering community the, for the practical engineers, I was able to come up with uh, seven published books in America or England where the principle of authoring these books was to fill the gap between academia and the industry. We work in power conditioning technique research too. Uh, I have sort of uh, had some very bad experiences about 25 years back when I uh, returned to my homeland after a short spell of work in another country and start building up a house in uh, end of a lane. In this lane around 7 p.m. in the night uh, the 230 volt line drops to less than 160 volts and that really creates an issue of running any any practical electrical electronic equipment at home because 95 percent of them do not work at such low voltages then when i looked at commercially available equipment families uh, none of them were designed to work for those worst case scenarios. So then we thought of why not we develop our own work. So I was uh, recruited by a brand new research institution in Sri Lanka. So and I had access to university students project uh, titles also. So we started developing a completely uh, radical technique uh, compared to any other commercial techniques people use to come up with single phase AC voltage regulators. So that work I continued for about 10 plus years uh, back home in Sri Lanka when I was working for Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technologies. So after I moved to Waikato University my first uh, postgraduate student was taking one of those developed techniques by me and added more capability to that, re reducing the harmonics and other things. So now we are going through the patenting process of that work also. So this area will be very attractive to uh, companies who are working on power quality equipment. For example, uh, A ABB, um, Alstom uh, and many other American companies may have some interest in these kinds of work. Okay, if I say something more about this voltage regulator technique, most of the commercial voltage regulator techniques use as bulky transformers or they use mechanically moving gadgets with servo motors. Now in, in our technique, we don't have moving parts, no servo motors, and also we use very much smaller transformers, probably sort of one-fifth of that size, for example. Okay, this is a machine called lightning surge simulator. It creates the equivalent of uh, nature's lightning uh, propagated into a practical electronic equipment for testing that against the bad effects of lightning. Okay, we use this lightning surge simulator to test the 
lightning absorption capability of these devices called supercapacitors. When you look at the supercapacitors, they are rated for very low voltages like less than 3 volts practically. Now this is 2.7 volts capability. But because these are able to store huge amounts of energy, short duration lightning can be absorbed into these ones without damaging them. We have done a, a piece of research about two years back and we have collected practical information to prove that effect which is published information right now. So now we are trying to develop various uh, practical techniques for lightning surge uh, uh, absorbers or surge absorbable uninterruptible power supplies like equipment using these research capabilities and these new devices like supercaps and similar devices. If I, the best example I could give you is from where I was uh, uh, having my previous life of electronics in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, for example, you had two very bad monsoon rain seasons. When the monsoon rain seasons, it starts with severe lightnings where you cannot sleep in the night. Now, if you have uh, unplugged all your electrical electronic appliances off from the plug, you can guarantee that with the best of surge protectors and UPS etc. installed to those ones, those things will be gone by the morning. So, in to those kinds of worst case scenarios, our research will be very attractive. On a worldwide basis, the lightning damage to electronic equipment and the loss of services due to that effect could be in hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Right? And most companies who are trying to develop and sell power quality products, they are trying to imp uh, mar do marginal improvements on existing techniques. So what we try to do is to come up with radically new techniques. Okay, in most of our electronic systems, we have batteries of different sizes, very tiny batteries to large sizes of batteries like this. All these are chemical energy storage systems with quite a lot of long-term usable energy. But these are very poor in delivering short duration large energy chunks. So in those situations, these guys come into the picture where they can deliver short duration large uh, power into your electronic equipment. So for that reason, uh, if I summarize my major area of work is uh, supercapacitors, uh, their applications and uh, combined products of batteries and supercapacitors line. Okay. Now, this is a commercially available large supercapacitor from an American company. Now, this is a basic uh, lantern battery which has enough energy to fill about 10 to 12 of these supercapacitors. So what I did a few minutes back was use that battery and I fill this supercapacitor with energy from the battery. Now what I'm trying to see is can I take a piece of metal, short circuit the battery across this, I don't see even a spark. Now that battery has a voltage of 6 volts with much more energy than the supercapacitor. Okay, these are some extremes of supercapacitors. This is a very large uh, supercapacitor, but this is a very thin profile, small supercapacitor coming from an Australian company. Across this range of devices, we can develop many new applications suitable for commercial electronic systems. Now, uh, for example, in one of our patented techniques using this type of supercapacitors, we have come up with some power management techniques where your battery runtime can be increased because that way we reduce the waste in electronic systems uh, powered by a battery pack.
you know, in uh, the power supply voltage regulator technique patented by us, uh, we use these supercapacitors for extending the runtime of the battery. For example, you are in a very long couple of conversations using a cell phone, you would like to have four or five minutes except extra to run another conversation, then you suddenly see the battery is going to be dead. That is the time where your last bit is so important in the energy storage in the battery. So what we try to do is how can we extract that remaining last bit without wasting that in power conversion electronics. So that's one of our uh, work going on with several PhD students etc. If you are a, a cellular phone company, if you give us a phone with the existing technique with the longest runtime battery and the option to insert our technique of the supercapacitor based voltage regulators, we will tr modify the low dropout regulator powered area to increase the overall battery runtime by minimizing the losses inside the cell phone. So the challenge is if you show us the sort of basis to sort of insert this, we will show you how you can get more out of your battery pack. We are involved in multiple areas of research. Uh, if I take the area of supercapacitor applications, one area is uh, high current voltage regulators where the efficiency of the power supply can be improved while maintaining the quality of DC rail. So that was some work we did in 2008 to 2010 and so on where we were granted a US patent uh, early this year. Then another area we are developing is uh, surge resistant uninterruptible power supplies based on supercapacitor energy storage. So uh, that area uh, of work will be very attractive to the companies who will be selling products like uninterruptible power supplies, power quality uh, products etc. in worst case power quality situations like the countries around the equator belt or where there is severe lightning uh, phenomenon around the surroundings etc. Actually one uh, thing I learned while developing this technique and talking to some uh, American and other companies is that uh, somebody at the top management level should make a decision to invest in these kinds of uh, research areas for the benefit of their commercialization of new techniques. Then that will give them a leading edge. At that point there must be something uh, collaboratively uh, working between the two institutions like our university and those companies so that everybody tries to achieve something for a win-win situation. Okay, around our labs here we have quite a lot of expensive equipment like lightning surge simulators and uh, various other test gear. Now for example this piece is about 55,000 New Zealand dollars a basic lightning surge simulator. A more expensive one could be about 80,000 New Zealand dollars. So similar equipment we are in the process of acquiring into our uh, high voltage laboratory where we can do all the practical testing of commercial devices and new techniques we develop. After my graduation I have a 36 years long career and uh, until my last 10 years uh, in New Zealand. I was not a, a traditional academic, I was a practical engineer and a research engineer. So right now my theme is develop things practically, commercially useful and with a creative outlook.